already we've already talked about our dreams we've talked about plans the fact remains as brother Wallace had said revival's coming the only question that remains is are you gonna jump on board I heard it put like this and I've used this illustration before something that brother Mooney had said it's like a wave it's either gonna crush you or you're gonna ride it and I say today that we jump on board and we ride this wave of revival until the very end Amen. amen if you would please grab your Bibles promise I'll try not to keep you too long but I do honestly believe especially over the past maybe 10 minutes of this service I've felt a very strong uh, confirmation in my spirit uh, but I can't I can't say that I've ever seen it transpire quite like that the fact is is that I honestly believe that we are in the middle of a communication with God and that's how church should be amen you will turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. We'll be starting at chapter 36. Amen. Chapter 36 of Isaiah, starting at verse 13. When you have it, say amen. 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 Isaiah 36 and 13. It says this. Then Reb Shaka stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and said, Hear ye the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, the Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and eat ye every one of his vine, and every one of his fig tree, and drink ye every one of the waters of his own cistern, until I come. And take you away to a land like your own. A land of corn and wine. A land of bread and vineyards. Beware lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arphad? Where are the gods of Zephyrim? And have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who are they among the gods of these lands that have delivered their land out of my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? But they held their peace and answered him not a word for the king's commandment was saying, answer him not. If you will turn to chapter 37. The very king that we were speaking of, the king of Judah, Hezekiah, we find him in a very contrasted situation. 37 and 15 says this. And Hezekiah prayed unto the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwelleth between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Incline thine ear to me, O Lord, and hear. Open thine eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear all the words of Sennacherib, which hath sent to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their countries and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they destroyed them. Now, therefore, O Lord, our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou only. Even thou only only if you would allow me just a couple of minutes this afternoon I would like to speak to you over this topic between the victory and the willowed harps between victory and the willowed harps amen will you help me pray this afternoon for the remainder of this service God I pray that above all else that you would reach into this place Lord and that you would begin to mold and shape us Lord, the way that you've seen fit Lord that we would be challenged by your word and that we would be molded and shaped to be what it is that you've called us to be nothing more and nothing less God allow us to be servants of your kingdom lead us and guide us by your wisdom and truth and I pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds to receive your word today and we praise you and we thank you for it Jesus come on can we clap our hands to him today can we give him some worship the praise that he so deserves 
Amen and amen. We serve a great God. Amen. Are you going to help me preach today? Amen. amen. You may be seated. In our text, we read a familiar story concerning Judah and Assyria. The story introduces us to a dire situation in which the people of God are once again put in harm's way by their adversary. Judah is looking death and destruction in the face by way of the great Assyrian forces. You see, they watched Assyria leave a trail of destruction leading straight to their front door, tearing down cities, making waste of kingdoms, and staking their claim in the name of their king, Sennacherib. Over a period of time, Judah watched in horror as the Assyrian Empire moved ever closer to their walls, mercilessly taking apart their allies and their neighbors. They even witnessed the fall and the captivity of the northern kingdom of Israel. They saw their own brethren, their own kinsmen destroyed and dragged away to a foreign land, leaving behind only memories of how it once was. And now Judah stands alone. And all of the mighty defended cities of Judah, they were surrounded by an impossible enemy, divided from any defense or any help that would ever come their way, completely secluded from their allies. And as their end game, Assyria besieged Jerusalem. They surrounded the city. It was the capital city of Judah. It was the place of commerce. And with a large army, they headed uh, by the high-ranking captain, and it was here that the stand was made and a compromise was offered to King Hezekiah, the king of Judah. And it was offered as a so-called peace offering. And so this general, this Rabshakeh stood and he spoke plainly in the language of the Jews in a manner that everybody could understand. And he boasted of all of the accomplishments of Sennacherib, king of Assyria. And he bragged of all the countries that Assyria had brought to their knees, of all the gods that Sennacherib had destroyed. He mocked the people's faith in Yahweh and arrogantly put Assyria's track record in Judah's face as a way of slander and intimidation. They said that your God is not big enough to go against the king of Assyria. Your God, this Yahweh, can never stand against Sennacherib. Just look at every other place that we've been. They trusted in their gods and we threw them in the fire. They trusted in their gods of stone and we destroyed them and we took their cities. That's just what the enemy does. That's just how our enemy is. He will tear down your faith and the God that you serve. He will completely demoralize your beliefs in the hopes that you will eventually come to some conclusion that he has something to offer you that God never did. You see, what the enemy will do is he will begin to pick apart everything that you say that you hold firm in your beliefs. Because if he can tear out your foundation, if he can tear out your trust in your God, then and he's got you beat already. And he comes boasting and he comes waving his pedigree and his resume in front of your face saying, I've taken down so many and I've taken down this one and that one. But God is saying, if you will continue to trust in me as you have. You see, no matter how many tricks are thrown your way, no matter how many devices that the devil will use, you are not the first one and he is not the first tactician. Let me make this absolutely clear. There is no new idea that the devil is going to throw in your face. If, if the devil has challenged you, then that challenge has already been defeated before. And I promise you, if you put your hand in the hand of the one that is leading you through, then there is no threatening that the devil could ever breathe against you, that any circumstance could ever put in your face that could ever stop you. Where is the faith that we so strongly sing about, that we preach about, that we testify about? Where is it in the face of adversity? And I tell you that it is found in the deeper, most intimate parts of your heart. Because it is there that your foundation is laid. And if you don't stand on that foundation, then you will fall for anything. And so there they stood. The general Rabshakeh talking about 
all the things that Sennacherib, king of Syria, had done. But what Sennacherib and his general didn't realize, what they didn't know, is that there in the temple, there in the dwelling place of the Most High, there was a believer that was interceding on behalf of the people. There was a man of faith who was on his face before God. He was a king who believed in the power of the Almighty and he refused to be wavered by the statements and the standings of the enemy. It didn't matter about the ridicule. It didn't matter about the mocking or the amount of slander or bragging that came from the mouth of Assyria. Hezekiah knew by experience the power of his God. He understood his God. And he knew that he was far more than able to deal with the threat that lied outside the walls of the city. And even in the midst of the turmoil, there was a rock. There was a foundation that had proven itself solid and strong. And it was that stronghold that Hezekiah turned to for the sake of Judah. It was that stronghold that Hezekiah knew would stand firm because his faith had been tested. His faith had been tried. You see, all of the Jews, they were instructed in the ways of the Lord from the time that they were young. He knew of the stories of his ancestors, the testimonies that had led Judah and the whole kingdom of Israel to where it was right then and there. And he knew no other place to turn but to the foundation of the Lord himself, the one that had showed himself mighty in battle, the one that said, I will be with you always. The way way that Hezekiah had seen it. If the Lord had taken them out of Egypt, if the Lord had brought them to a land of promise, then there was nothing that was going to stop the hand of the Lord. Not even the mighty empire of Syria. Not even King Sennacherib. Who is Sennacherib? Who is Syria? What is your circumstance? What is your problem compared to the hand of the Lord? What is it that could ever come against us? You see, faith is an interesting thing. It's not just rooted in what you do. It's not just rooted in what you believe. But it's rooted in the testimony that you have experienced. And the testimonies that you have heard. Do you understand how this is working? Because if that's the case... If that is the basis of what we stand on and what it is that we say that we believe, then there is no king of Assyria. There is no mighty empire and there is no sin. There is no retribution. There is nothing that could ever come between you and God if you just so happen to hold on to the promise. See, at times, the chaos we face in life can throw us into very similar situations that we have just read about. We find ourselves cornered by our enemy. Our spiritual well-being threatened by things that we cannot even comprehend, let alone overcome. And it's in these times of turmoil that the very foundation of who we are in Christ is brought into question in our hearts. And we begin to become focused on the overwhelming forces outside our front door then we are focused on our spirituality. Then we are focused on our walk with God. Then we are focused on faith and his ability. And as doubt begins to creep in, the foundation of our world begins to shake and to fall apart right from underneath of our feet and right in front of our face. The enemy begins to feed in to our desperation by slandering everything that we believe in. In our circumstance, the ability of God is called into question. And suddenly, everything that we had thought that we ever knew becomes artificial in our very hands. Everything that we were ever promised becomes fake and crumbles apart. Things that we once thought were sure. Things like our walk with God. Things like our calling. Things like our promise. Those aspects that made us who we were are suddenly stripped away from us. And we're told to survive. And where our faith once resided, we find an overwhelming sense of nothingness, just an empty void, destitution. And ultimately we find ourselves in a doomed and defeated state in the face of impossible odds. We are laid out on our face due to an enemy that we cannot overcome. 
and it feels like there is no way of escape that there is absolutely no chance of victory but I'm here to remind somebody and if you don't get this then I pray to God that you will write it down I pray to God that this will sink in because if you miss this you've missed everything I'm here to tell you this evening that there is still a God that specializes in the impossible there is still a God that can do what you say cannot be done there is a God that can defy what you have defined as logic there is a God that can bring you through the fire that bring you around the obstacle no matter what situation that you're facing regardless of whatever enemy has perched himself at your gate listen there's one thing that we have to make solid right now is do we honestly believe that God is who he says that he is that's the fight that every Christian fights every day that when they wake up is God who he says he is and I'm here to tell you by by way of testimony by way of things that I personally that have seen by things that you have seen that our God is a healer that our God is a way maker that our God is a peace giver he is our defense and our victor our provider our savior he is the same through all generations yesterday today and forever if that means that he ever was a healer then he is and he will be a healer listen to me now if God was ever a way maker if he was ever a peace giver a provider he will always be a way maker, a peace giver, and a provider. Listen, I'm not just standing up here talking about some good idea. I'm not just preaching about something to make you feel good. I'm talking about the great I am. I'm talking about Yahweh, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, come on, I don't think we're getting this. What I'm talking about is the one that saved your life. I'm talking about the one that puts you on your face at an altar and changed your life, turned you around and set your path straight. That's who I'm talking about. I'm speaking directly to your testimony today, and I am challenging you to stand firm on it because it is the only lifeline that you'll ever have. And to rest assured that when you face the enemy, that when he comes knocking on your front door, that you have the ability that you have a God that will bring you through we get so caught up so distracted at times with the size of our circumstance the sheer threat of our enemy that we forget exactly who it is that we serve our focus changes never do we fully understand how frail that we are until we're faced with circumstances beyond our ability to control all of a sudden everything comes right into perspective of our limitations of things that we cannot do we become more vulnerable as the situation grows more dire until eventually our faith has worn so thin that a contrary breeze can shift us and tear us apart we become weak and it's everything that we have in us just to hold it together there's no longer any will to fight and I promise I'm going somewhere it's at this time that our adversary begins to point out and begins to brag about all of his victories and all of his trophies and all of his accomplishments begins to flaunt because after all he has destroyed the best and the brightest how is it that we could ever stand a chance he took down our peers he destroyed everything that they were about he wreaked havoc on our family he began to pick apart our church brick by brick and it was only a matter of time before it got to us anyway maybe he's got a good point maybe we should just throw in the towel raise the white flag and give in he's got the track record what if he's right and God doesn't pull through that would make me just like everybody else who has fallen under his blade. That would make me just like everybody else and just another name on his resume. Just another trophy to set up on his shelf. But I'm here to tell you, APC, that you are not just anybody. You are not just an individual. You are a child and a servant of the Most High God. Come on, it's time that we snapped out of our identity crisis and understand who it is that we really are. And who it is that is behind us.
It's high time that we looked our tormentor, the devil, in the face and let him know beyond the shadow of a doubt that the very things that he intended to use to bring us shame, to bring us defeat, will be the very thing that our God will use to bring us victory and to show himself mighty in the midst of the circumstance. It'll be the very things that he tries to destroy you with that God will turn around and use as a tool for a testimony to show that he is indeed able. Why is that? Why do we have this, this privilege, if you will? Why is it that this God would show himself mighty in the midst of our circumstance? And I will tell you, it is because we are his name called people, called out for his specific purpose. We are not our own, and thanks be to God for it. We went down in the waters of baptism with the name of the Lord Jesus called over us. We are no longer our own, but we are indeed his. We have his spirit living, moving, breathing within us. There's no way that we can lose. There's absolutely no way that we can be overcome because he entered into a covenant with God. We have entered into a covenant relationship with him. We carry his name. We are his people and we will never face defeat because God will never be defeated. Amen. Do you understand? We are the people of God. We are the we are the servants of the most high. Amen. We are the kingdom called generation and it's high time that we begin to understand that whatever it is that we face, regardless of whatever it is that puts us down or however it is that we get our name dragged through the mud, it doesn't matter because the spirit of God is there to help you through it and God will never lose. <laughs> But before victory is ever an option, we must first understand that we have no control over the situation. Just like Judah, surrounded by such a great and vast force as Assyria. On their own, they didn't stand any chance whatsoever. There was no hope for Judah, not in and of themselves. See, we're powerless by ourselves, and thus we stand no chance of achieving victory by anything that we could ever do or say. But when we leave our situation in more capable hands, when we leave our circumstances in the hands of God, He can do what we thought to be impossible. You see, we serve a God, as I had said before, who specializes in the impossible. He can make a way where we have never seen a way. He can bring victory where all we see is defeat. And from the ashes of failure, he can rise up mighty testimonies of his glory and of his power. Because that's just who our God is. That's just who we serve. He is a changer, a builder, a shaper of victories and of testimonies. A great master of destiny. Who could stand before the Lord? What challenge is too great for the Almighty? See, nobody understood this better than Hezekiah. He knew when staring an enemy like Assyria in the face, the only one to turn to was God. He was the only thing left. He understood that if he attempted to fight against the Assyrian forces on his own, that the entirety of the people of God would be uprooted from their home country and spread across the Assyrian Empire. See, Israel had already lost. They were taken captive by Assyria. All that remained of the people of God was Judah. And if Judah was lost, then the people of God would be no more. And the promises of God would come to nothing. Because Assyria, their tactics of war were as follows. They would uproot their captives. And they would ethnically spread them out. It was their way to avoid an uprising among their forced citizens by diluting their heritage. Ultimately, they would forget who they were and where they had come from. They would forget their identity. Let me tell you something. There is strength in knowing who you are in God. There is strength in understanding that you are a child of God. And if the enemy ever causes you to forget that, if he ever causes you to forget your spiritual heritage, my friend, we stand in a dangerous spot. The fact of the matter is this, is that we are indeed children and servants of the Most High. Hezekiah understood that there was far too much on the line 
for his limited human intuition to handle. There was far too much at risk to fail, and he knew that peace claims from Assyria. Saying that they would take the people of God to a land like their own was a farce. He knew that this was no part of God's plan for the people. Because this was not a part of the promise. Listen, be very careful when the enemy starts to tell you, I've got a promise that looks like the promise of God. I will take you to a land like your own. No, no, don't settle for a like. Don't settle for a similarity. Because when God has spoken a promise to you, you go for that and nothing more. You go for that and nothing less. Because God has a plan for you from the beginning. Don't listen to anything that says, well, why don't you come over here that looks like that? We have a place that looks exactly like where you are right now. It's okay. Just give in and come along. No, the promise of God is is something that... mm, It's something that cannot be sacrificed. The only way that I could ever put it is it's something that has no equal. Why don't you wait until I come and take you to a land like your own? No, there is no land like this. There is no promise like this. That land was for you. That promise was for you. It was tailored for you. And no enemy could ever give you anything that would ever equal up to that. So as tempting as it sounded, all Assyria could ever offer Judah was a cheap knockoff of God's promise. The only thing that the enemy could ever offer you is exactly that. A cheap knockoff, a counterfeit of what God had already promised you. Listen, the enemy begins to attempt to compromise. We must remember that regardless of how good it sounds, regardless of how easy it would be to throw in the towel, it will never measure up to the plan of God in your life. It will never measure up to what it is that God is trying to do in you and through you. We sell ourselves short. When we take the easy route of compromise and ultimately we hand our calling, we hand our purpose, we hand our promise and our victory over to the enemy. Everything that God had said would build us up, we hand it over to the adversary. We must understand that our adversary is a liar and the father of them. There is nothing that he could ever promise you that will ever fulfill you. Make no mistake, there is nothing that he could ever say that he would give you, no matter how pretty of a picture that it is, that would ever equate to what God is going to give you. Sure, his peace claims seem good on the surface, but the deeper implications are a fate worse than death, and it is an attempt to steal your victory. That's why when we find ourselves confronted by the enemy and surrounded, that's when we need to be like Hezekiah, That's when we need to understand that the situation is out of control and out of our hand. That's when we need to find an altar. That's when we need to find a prayer closet somewhere and say, God, surely you hear the slander. Surely you hear what they're saying. Surely you can hear the adversary. You hear their challenge, God. Show yourself mighty in the midst of my circumstance and form a testimony from this. Pull through just like you have before, not just for my sake but for every single country that Assyria has torn down right behind them. Every every last bit of destruction that they brought here. Pull us through, God, so that they will be a testimony, not just to the Assyrians, God, but to every country that they've destroyed. See, your testimony isn't just about you. What God does for you isn't just about where you are. But it is a tool by which other people can see the hand of God in your life. What would it take to have that kind of prayer? Not just God deliver me for my sake, but God deliver me for my family's sake. God deliver me for my for my church's sake. God deliver me for my friend's sake. Lord, let there be a testimony that would come up from the ashes of failure. Oh, how we forget. How we forget the purpose of God's hand in our life how we forget the purpose of what it is that we're to be doing it isn't about healing so much as it is about healing for the sake of witnessing Hezekiah understood this deliver us Lord so that your name may be glorified not just for my sake but so that others around me may know that you are God alone See, our testimony is our strongest weapon because it is evidence. It is evidence that God is who he says that he is. And he can do what it says he can do. I'm getting ready to come to a close. 
this is our defense. A God who intercedes on our behalf. A God who has an expected end for us. He will stop at nothing to bring us where we need to be to be fulfilled in Him. And just like He did with the Assyrians, He will turn our adversary away. Right back where they came from. And in doing so, he will fight our battles for us. And he will bring us victory. Here's how the story ended. Before they fled, before the Assyrians fled, the Spirit of the Lord swept through the camp and killed about 185,000 of their forces without Judah ever even having to pick up a weapon. Took a chunk out of their forces without Judah ever even having to pick up a sword. Isaiah 59 and 18 says this. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay. Fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. To the islands he will repay recompense. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion. And unto them that turn from the transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. As for me... This is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee. And my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. Now the phrase here, lift up a standard, is translated from the word noose in Hebrew. And out of the 140 plus times, this is one of the only times in scripture that it is translated this way. Most others representing a kind of fleeing or running away. But the tense in which this verb is translated means to drive at. So in a literal sense, it's God driving into and pushing back those which would rise against us. We have an oppressive force coming from in front of us. And that's all that we can see. But our great and mighty Savior comes from behind. An unstoppable force that not only protects, but pushes away see it comes down to this and I've preached this whole message just to bring it to this one point no matter what it is that's caused, that's caused you to doubt your only promise of well being comes from the hand of God and that he is more than capable we serve a God that cannot fail if you would please stand with me. we serve a God that cannot fail no matter what it is that we face every head bowed and every eye closed Psalms 137 by the rivers of Babylon there we sat down yea we wept when we remembered Zion we hanged our hearts upon the willows in the midst thereof for there they that carried us away captive required of us a song and they that wasted us required us mirth saying sing us one of the songs of Zion how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? This isn't the first battle that you've had to face, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm not sure who I'm talking to. But rest assured that it also won't be your last. But just like this isn't the first time that you've had to deal with it, and just like Israel, you'll face things. And the outcome might be hard for you to swallow because you don't understand how you got to where you are. And why God hasn't shown up in your defeat. You've left your harp in the willow because the worship in the midst of failure just doesn't seem to make much sense. It almost seems a mockery in light of your dead dreams and promises. I can't stand up here and tell you that I have an answer to why you're facing what it is you're facing. Of why you're going through what it is that you're going through. I can't stand up here and act like that I have answers. But you must rest assured that God's timing is perfect regardless if you are victorious or if you are held captive. What lies after defeat? What lies after heartbreak? It's the very same thing that lies between your victory and your harp that hangs in the willow. And that is your song about a God who cannot and will not fail. It's not a matter of circumstance or difficulty. It's a matter of faith. Some of us, some of us in the face of what we go through, in the face of defeat, we need to wipe our eyes and understand that our story isn't over yet. 
understand that God's not done with us yet and we need to pick up our harps from the willow tree and we need to sing of the Redeemer because deliverance could only be a prayer away deliverance could only be a song away you're not defeated yet amen in the face of adversity why don't we bring ourselves to an altar why don't we turn our focus away from everything that's wrong and why don't we focus on the things that are right why don't we pick up the harps from the willow trees why don't we stop focusing on the fact that we are a captive and start focusing on the fact that we serve a god that is a deliverer I'm pleading with you today. I am challenging you to come to this altar with the understanding that at the foot of the cross, there is one who can change your world and change your understanding. It isn't about the circumstance, but it's about your faith and about your reaction. Why don't you come today? Winding roads, mountains high. 